Our subject for this month, one word, that word is unified. Say it with me, if you will. Unified. Say it one more time. Unified. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I am going to jump straight in. Everybody shout okay. I do want to say to everyone tuning in to our broadcast via live stream for those who will hear our message and are not here, that Psalms 133 is a passage of scripture that we have extrapolated or pulled for the purpose of speaking to you every week this month. We do want to make sure you're clear. We will not specifically deal with it this week, for I want to talk about uh, something uh, about someone who is really, really, really the master of unity, if you will, who will lead us back into Psalms 133. So thank you for uh, allowing us that. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to be unified. And I defined it in the heading so that you were not uh, unsure about what we were communicating. And it means to make or become a single unit. Please tell me what unified means. To make or become, to make or become what? A single unit. Everyone shout, shout a single unit. Now let's make note that the enemy specializes in trying to make us all divided units. Are y'all listening to me? Satan's agenda is to cause us to live in the same region, to live sometimes in the same community, to live sometimes in the same house as divided units. Are y'all listening to me? I said, are y'all listening to me? What we're going to talk about this, this month is how important it is, how, how pivotal it is to the plan of God that you and I live not just in the same house, but we go to the same churches, we live in the same communities as a single unit. Everybody shout, I hear you. Say it again. Which brings up, uh, why do only uh, three people on this side hear me? I say, say y'all hear me, please. <laughs> All right, all right, so the, the, the next word I want you to look at is the word community, and I was going to um, just put the way I want you to understand the word down on your paper, but my wife, Dr. Teresa White, she gets upset when I make up words and stuff that, that Webster has not identified as words. Uh, and, so, and so I decided I would give you community, but ultimately I want you to think about it as a common unity. Everybody say common unity. Because hidden in the idea of community is a group of people who have certain commonalities or share certain things in common with one another. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. So as some of those things would be people with a common purpose, common values, who live in unity with one another, becoming one with those whom share or who share or with whom you share commonalities. That's community or common unity. Everybody shout, all right then. I want to show you two common unities that were established by God. The only two that I know of, if you know others, find them this week, shoot me an email and say, Pastor White, I know some other communities or common unities that God has established. But the first um, entity, the first community that God established is the family. Is the family. The first thing he did was he created. I'm in Genesis 1. God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. And then he said, I'm going to create man in our image after our likeness. And the Bible says God created man in his image. The Bible says that this man that he was created had in him, uh, he was Adam, he was the first man, but he had in him this, this dual uh, propensity, if you will. Inside of him was both male and female. God walking with him allowed him to name all of the birds of the air, all of the beasts of the field, all of the fish in the sea. And then he said to him, it is not good for you to be alone. Adam did not know he was alone. This was God who told him he was. Adam says, okay, God, what do we do about it? God said, I'm going to put you to sleep and pull out of you that which does not find its full expression until it has an identity, not away from you, but when the two of you come together to give me one cohesive whole. In Genesis 2, verse 24, Adam sees this woman that God brings from his rib, and he starts to prophesy. Adam has no mother or father, everyone. He prophetically starts to say, for this cause shall a man leave his father father and his mother cleave to his wife and they too shall become and right there in Genesis chapter 2 we have this entity this institution called family and God gives us the idea that in order for family to work it must have unity 
It must be unified. And so the enemy works overtime to divide our families. And if you look in our culture and our community and around our world, the one thing that the enemy is attacking like never before is the family. The reason he is attacking it not like never before, because God is the architect of family and God, and God has designed family that it only works the way he created it to work if it is a unified whole. Y'all are off for quiet, but y'all listening, right? All right. Second entity that God establishes is the entity we call the church. Everybody shout the church. church. Say it again. The church. the church is this unit that, that gives rise through the life, perfect life, shameless death, and glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus. When he gets up, he gives birth to this entity called the church. Many people, even inside of church, have a lot of negative things to say about the church. But the truth of the matter is, until you fully understand that God is the architect of this, you don't really get what's going on anyway. Are y'all listening to me? So this is more than just a gathering in a building. You, every last one of you, make up the church. And so God then says, all of you are little churches running around. What makes us flow together and harmonize is when we come together as. And so Satan then seeks every day to attack this community called the church. Only two that God has set up. One is the, the family. The other is the church. If you look throughout our culture at which two entities are under the most attack in our culture, it will be and and one of the things that is concerning is that we have young people who are in here now who are totally tuned out because they are convinced that the world has more to offer than the church. And if the church doesn't get it together and get back to a place where we're focused on the one who brought us together, we're going to literally end up having church on Sundays but never being the church God called us to be. And that breaks my heart to think about it because I know that inside of here are really good people who want to make a difference, who want to live lives that matter. But so many times the enemy causes us to focus on what we don't have in common till we lose the fact or lose sight of the fact that we have more in common than we don't have. Everybody shout yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Shout down your row at your neighbor and say, um, hey, hey there, hey. don't turn your head to me because you don't like the way I look today. We both love Jesus. We both think he's awesome. We both going to pursue a more excellent way. That's a lot more in common than this outfit I put on. So tell them, let's pause for the cause and give heaven a collective applause. <laughs> Doesn't that sound so much, so much better when we, when we do it together? Let's do that one more time together. Let's just give heaven a great big all. Now watch this. Here is, my, here is my clap to God by myself. Brother Solomon. It's okay. But wonder what would happen if these guys on this road joined me this time. Y'all help me. Let's, let's praise our God. That sound better? Still doesn't sound as good as it could. Let's get this whole side over here to join us. We're about to get there. What do y'all think about these guys? You think they could help us? Let's do it together. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Who is, God, who is he talking to? To all of us, the church. And so when we come together, we come together, we ask you to put your hands together and lift your voice, not because we're just trying to make you go through a ritual, but because we know this thing goes better, it flows better, it sounds better, making its way through earth up to heaven when we do it as unity. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. Everybody shout with me, Pastor White. We're ready to be unified. The greatest unity the world has ever known is the Christian God, the Christian God. And that's who I want to talk about today in my next 20 minutes. The greatest unity the world has ever known is the Christian God. And 
one of the things I want you to think about is that many of you, many of us have gone to church for years upon years, and we think that every religion has the same God. I want to announce to you that we absolutely do not, and it is crucial. One of the reasons I talk to you and I say to you every week, I am not after your emotions but your mind, is because I know the enemy is going to try and get you emotional this week. But one of the things that the enemy runs up against that defeats him is when he runs up against rational Christians. See, I, 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 I take issue with a world who says that we are empty headed if we believe in a sovereign God. I say, let's just let's just, you know, let's sort of talk this out just a little bit. You are your God. <laughs> you, your God. Yeah, I mean, let's just, I mean, y'all, y'all act like there's something left. Nothing left. Just think about it. You, your God. You, your God. How should I say it, Dr. White? Because they don't understand me. Okay, she wants me to change it. You are your God. <laughs> I just say it real quick to you. You, your God. Now, how's that working? I'm talking about when life comes in at you. How does it work with you being your God? You with, you with your infinite wisdom, how does it work when you're faced with a, with a dilemma you have no answers to? All right. So you, your God, is a myth that, that doesn't work. That, that is something that's been disproven by everybody in here. Me, my God, don't work. Say it with me. Me, my God, doesn't work. Young people, say it with me. Me, my God, does not work. All right, so we have to find then God. The Christian God is the greatest display of unity. We serve in the Christian church. Y'all listen to me so y'all can be clear about what, who we serve. We serve one God who exists eternally in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are distinct in personality, but one in personhood. They are unique in that it takes three to give us one, the greatest unity the world has ever known. Now, Islam misunderstands the Christian God, and they try and argue with those of us who will not listen to me today because you know more than we do, and you will go out and Islam will say, you serve a polytheistic God. You serve three gods. And you will say, no, I don't. And they say, well, explain the Trinity to me. And you'll say, well, I can't because I didn't think it was worth listening to. And they'll say, that's what I'm talking about. Because I can, I can explain to you Allah, but you can't explain, explain to me Jehovah. And it is our inability to communicate what it is we believe that is causing us to be so dysfunctional in many ways, as well as to lose generations. I don't want that to continue to happen. Everybody shout, not on our watch. We serve one God who exists eternally in. Just give me two other persons up here, please. Quickly, it doesn't matter. Yeah, thank you. Come on, I need two persons. One right here, one right here. We'll let this be the Father. We'll put you here. We'll let this be the Son. We'll put you here. I'll be the Holy Spirit. No, I need one more. Come, Elder Carla. Let, let, me, let me have the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, the Christian God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They three give us how many gods? One God. If I extrapolate or pull this one, which one are you again? You're the son? You need to know now. You need to know. <laughs> if I pull him away by himself and try to make him God the way the Jesus only movement tries to do, do I have God if I extrapolate or pull him away from the unity? That's important for you to understand. In order for the Christian God to work, they must be one at all times one. One of the things that's so important about the Christian God is because of sin, because of sin, this perfect unity went through what we call in theological terms a kenosis. Don't let the, nine, the word um, uh, mess with you. I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that for the first time that because God loved you and I so much, this unity would divide temporarily. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with. But the word also at the same time was. 
The same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 14, and the word became and dwelt among us. How did the world get here? The Father sent him by way of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brought him down, put him into a virgin called Mary, and he sat there and grew in wisdom and knowledge and favor with God and with man. The whole time he was here in the earth and everybody was trying to convince us that he was a heresy because he said stuff like, when you see me, you've seen the father. And because we don't understand community, we don't understand what it means to be unified. We said, there's no way I can see you and see the father. He said, you a lie because I don't do anything except what I see my father do. The greatest unity ever known to mankind, the Christian God. Hallelujah. Come back down. His whole whole time on earth, all he was doing was looking forward to the day that he would be back in perfect harmony with the Father. Are y'all listening to me? When he was on the earth, he prayed in John 17. Father, I pray for these. I pray that you will make them one as we are one. He says, I do not pray for them alone, Father, but I pray for all those who will come to know me through their testimony. I pray that you would make them one, make them live as one cohesive whole. Make them them live as a unity. Make them live as one unit. The prayer of Jesus on his way back to what he had before he ever came to the earth. And then he says, Father, oh yeah, the hour is come. Glorify your son with the same glory that he had from the beginning. So y'all, y'all read that and you're like, he just said glorify the son. No, he was saying, Father, I'm ready to come back into one cohesive whole. Before he could go, he would have to, he would have to journey. Y'all all right? He would have to journey to a cross. Notice that the whole time he was on the cross, they had beat him. He never said a word. Pilate said, are you the one? He said, are you a king? He looked at Pilate and said, you say I'm a king. Pilate said, don't play with me. I got power to take your life. Only time he ever said something. He said, you don't have any power over me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Again, this is this is this is the God in him standing up. Say, hold up. I came to save you, Pilate, but you can't take anything from me. I have power to lay my life down and make no mistake about it. I'm gonna pick it back up again. Yeah, he just just big him up. So so no ordinary man, 100% man, 100% God in the same body. The, while he was on the cross, the only time that we hear him really frustrated was not necessarily when he got there but before he got there in Gethsemane. The weight of his father come here father. The whole time come here Holy Spirit. The whole time that he had been here in the earth the father had had his face turned towards him and as long as his daddy's face was towards him he could do anything his daddy asked him to do. The Holy Spirit kept him strengthened Yeah, he kept him strengthened so that no matter where he went, no matter what life threw at him, he was okay. And now, for the first time in his life, in order to become sin for you and I, in order to take the penalty that you and I deserve without wrath from the Father, so that you and I could observe or obtain mercy from the Father without any wrath, he would have to have his Father and the Spirit turn his back on him. And it would turn his back on him and leave him temporarily to become the penalty that you and I deserve. And he said when thinking about it, God, if there's another way, please let it, let this cup pass from me. Don't make me go through having to live three days without you. We have been a unity from the beginning. We have been a unity since before the beginning. 
his struggle was being divided. But God loved you and I so much that he would divide himself temporarily so he could bring us into a unity. Whatever you do, don't allow the enemy to divide us when God has spent so much to unify us. I would, that's a good place to put your hands together and say, yes, Lord. Thank you. Come down off the cross. Thank you, fellas. Does that help everybody? Does that make sense? The greatest unity the world has ever known is the Christian God. The greatest unity the world has ever known is the Christian God. Say it again with me. The greatest unity the world has ever known is the Christian God. And any time the enemy tries to get, convince me that being divided in our culture, that being divided when it comes to my wife and I, being divided by the color of my skin, being divided by how much money I have or don't have, I know that that's not from God. I know that it's not because he's perfect in harmony. You are God in three persons. Bless it. Try unity. That's who he is. Two institutions that he has established. Tell me those institutions again. In the church. Tell me the two institutions the enemy is after more than anything. So I wanted to take the time to tell you that so that you don't allow the enemy to make us disjointed as we do family and be his church. That's for every married couple in here, every potentially, every single in here that will be married. The enemy doesn't mind you getting married. He don't want you to become one. For every person in here that's in church, every person looking for a church, the enemy does not mind you in church. He does not want you to become one. Our God is one. And his desire that is, is that his body operates as one. Hallelujah. They are cold. If y'all can turn the heat up. I'm going to sweat regardless, so turn, I mean, don't turn heat up, turn the air up to 70, if you will, so that they can warm up. <laughs> Dr. Nico White is going to literally need a heater if y'all don't turn it up. Y'all all right? So can I, let me tell you the blessings of unity, because I'm going to, I'll build upon these each week this month. Y'all all right? All right. All right, good. Thank you. I need a little help. Y'all are scaring me. Y'all all right? All right, so let's talk about the blessings of unity. Y'all, Everybody say the blessings of unity. Now, I want to show you the blessings of unity based on the life of Jesus Christ and his cohesiveness with his Father and with the Spirit. And then we're going to read them back into, over the course of this week, Psalms 133, and extrapolate out what God means when he says, oh, how good and blessed it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, because there I command blessings. I want to announce to you that this month we're going to come to understand that part of the reason that we are not what we should be, I'm talking about walking in the favor of God the way we should, is because we're disjointed. And the moment we come together as a unity, God has announced to all of us listening, Psalms 133, that I will command favor upon unified people. I will command, com command favor upon those of you who understand you have more in common than you have against one another. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of Amos, how can two walk together? You can't do it because a divided house cannot stand. Y'all listening to me? So let's talk about the first blessing of unity. And the first blessing of unity or the first blessing of being in a common unity is that community it breeds a healthy sense of belonging. Everybody shout, yes, it does. Say it again. Say it one more time. It breeds a healthy sense of what? A belonging. A belonging. You know, one of the things that messes us up is that we spend so much time trying to get away from mama and daddy now and get out into the world and the world jacks us up because we don't have a clue where we belong. We get out trying to fit in in places we don't belong and by, while rejecting the place we do belong. Yeah. Are y'all listening to me? Yeah. I said, are y'all listening to me? Yeah. I put in your notes this quote. It was from my heart, and I want you to hear me because I think it is the heart of God, and I want you to hear the words. You cannot know who you are until you know whose you are. 
And many people try to figure out, try to figure out who they are before they figure out whose they are, and it won't happen. In order for you to fully know who you are in the earth, so many people leave home. I'm going to find myself. How are you going to find yourself when you rejected the self you came from? So when we come back to God, we don't get to come back to God and say, God, you need to know this is just how I am. He says, how are you going to tell me who you are when I'm the one who formed you in your mother's belly? So you can't tell me who you are because you don't know who I am. As you get to know who I am, you'll get to understand who you are. And you can't know who you are till you figure out whose you are. If you travel to a foreign country, the first thing they're going to want to know is where you from. Exactly right. mm -hmm. Now, what you look like showing up talking about, I don't know. <laughs> they're not just asking you. So they're asking you. They want to know from which have you originated. Yeah. Who your people. Because <laughs> they know this is going to tell them something about who you are. Because you must have a healthy sense of belonging to something in order to matter in this world. And the enemy convinces us we can live as islands apart from anybody and still matter. But the devil is a liar. If we're going to matter, if it's going to count what we're doing, we've got to belong to something. Shout down your row and shout at your name and tell them, neighbor. You have to, at some point, belong to something bigger than yourself. Hallelujah. Jesus of Nazareth, I don't have time to go through the notes, but read the verses on your own. Jesus of Nazareth shows up in the Jordan River in Matthew chapter 3. And John, the revelator, John the Baptist, he is baptizing men. And he says to the men, you have need to be baptized with me, but there comes one after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to lack. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. As John is talking, the Lamb of God steps up in the river. He is 30 years old. He has been in the earth for 30 years, and we do not have any recorded history of him operating as anything other than a man, except for at the age of 12 at his bar mitzvah, he shows up in the temple, left his mama and daddy, and he was talking with the scribes, the Pharisees of his day. 12-year-old guy schooling the, the elders. His mom and daddy are looking every, everywhere, and they find him, and they say, boy, what is wrong with you? And he says, wait a minute. Before I belong to you, I belong to my daddy. I'm doing my daddy's business, mama. And he defined for them that if you really want to know who I am, you got to sense where I belong. So now he is ready to begin his ministry, and in the wisdom of God... God will not let him start his ministry without announcing to everybody who he belongs to. He goes down in the Jordan River and comes up. And John said, I heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it lit upon him. And for the first time, we saw the trinity of heaven manifested in the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm preaching better than you listening. You ought to read your Bible. This is good stuff. And before Jesus ever preached a sermon, before he ever healed the sick, he had a healthy sense of his belonging. <laughs> Man, for those of you that leave out of here today, and you don't belong to anything. You just, a, you just a wild boy. Can't nobody tell you anything. Life is going to be cruel. Life will beat you up if you don't know where you belong. But what I love about knowing where I belong is that when I'm overwhelmed, I can run back to my belongings. I can run back to my family. I can run back to my God. And I can help. We can, we can get through this. Are y'all listening to me? Healthy sense of belonging. Two, 
my time is up, but number two, community breeds a shared belief system. Everybody shout, it does. Say it again. Say it one more time. One of the reasons people want to know where you come from, Sister Luana, because they want to get an idea of what you've been taught. The old folk used to, be, used to say, boy, don't, you better go out. Don't you act like you ain't from somebody. Now, boy, don't act like you. Act like you came from somewhere. A healthy sense of belief. Community breeds a healthy sense of belief. You know what's, what's difficult? I watch my wife sometimes. I watch the way she operates in, in the home, and I know that this is stuff she learned from my mama and her grandmama now. Mm-hmm. I just watch her. <laughs> I just watch, and every now and then I say, her grandmama, it, who, bless her soul, is going on to be with the Lord. Her name was Ro, Rosa Green. I call her Miss Ro. And I said, is that Ro coming out? Because <laughs> there's just some things that are passed down that we do. Like, like if your family did family, if that's what y'all believed in, family, then guess what? That thing just manifests itself. What concerns me about the generation that is here is that we have generations of traditions that are being lost because the enemy is convincing us we're going to do better divided. Yes. What, con what concerns me about the church is that the enemy is coming in and is convincing us that we are smarter than generations that have gone before us. That the traditions handed down to us no longer matter. That the beliefs that they had no longer matter. We can change the beliefs. And I want to tell you, man, that is nonsense. That is so silly. To believe that we are smarter than, than Abraham, than Isaac, than Jacob, than, than David, than Solomon, than Samuel. To believe that we, are, that we have greater revelation in Ezra, than Nehemiah, than, 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 than Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, than, than Saul of Tarsus. To believe that we are so much smarter than everybody else. It's a demonstration of our folly. At some point, we have to get down and learn what they learned. So community breeds a shared sense of belief. I gave you this quote. You read the scripture this week. All things, according to Jesus, are possible if you guys have a shared belief system. Like when they were singing earlier and they said, they said, he's mighty, he's mighty. One of the reasons I wanted you to sing that over and over is because we have to believe that. We have to believe our God is awesome. We have to believe he can move mountains. We have to believe that he's the savior of the whole world. Well, I don't, I don't really believe that. I mean, I ain't, I'm not going to be so, just so arrogant to believe there's only one way back to, to the Father. Well, that's what he's saying. I'm not asking you to be arrogant. If there's arrogance, it would be on his part. But then how do we tell the Savior of the world he's arrogant when he humbled himself and took on a cross? So we just got to think this stuff through. How are we going to be deeper than the one that brought us out of the depths? We can't. He said he's the only way. And if there's a problem, it is with my Savior, not with me. I just believe him. Y'all say it with me. I just. Say it again. See, not enough. Y'all remember that clap thing? Not enough of you saying it with me. I just. As you go through this week and life tries to overwhelm you, tell me what you're going to say. I just. Let's say it again. I just. Why are you still fighting for your marriage and it seems like it's upside down? Because I, why are you paying your tithes this week and you know you're financially stretched? Because why do you keep going to that job and, and, and staying on that job and they don't appreciate you? Because I just, why are you still praying for them children and they acted up more and more every day? Because I just. Why are you lending your gifts and talents to that ministry? And it seemed like y'all aren't going. There. I just. Why you keep going out, putting in applications? Everybody done told you they ain't hiring right now. Because I just. And if you keep believing him. You're going to find out. 
that he is a promise keeper. And I don't want you to wait until he does it to believe it. There are people around you that are evidence that God keeps his word. So I want some people that know that he's a promise keeper to bless him real fast so that you can encourage those around you. If you don't have enough faith right now, let me just bless him. Watch me. Because he has commanded blessings as I continue to believe him. Now, which brings us to the last point. I'm way over my time, but when you are in a community, you have a healthy sense of belonging. Okay, how far away I get, I know I belong to something and someone. I'm Deborah and James, boy. I know that. I, I may have found myself in some ugly places, but I was always Deborah and James's boy. Deborah and James, the whole time that I was coming up, they always taught me that no matter where you go, son, you're God's child. There are a couple things I always knew. I belong to them and I belong to him. Even in an ugly place. The more that I thought about where I belonged, I started to think they taught me better than what I'm doing. And it was just a matter of making up my mind. I believe what they said. I believe that if you honor the Lord, he'll honor you. I believe that if you cry out to him, he'll respond to you. I believe your mom and daddy. I'm coming back. See, the only reason you get to come back to something is if you know you belong to it. What the enemy tries to do is get us far away so that we can't find our way out. But when you know where you belong, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger, they won't follow. They know whose voice they belong to. And so that brings us to the third dimension. As we began to be unified we, we, we get similar behaviors. We show up into situations and we get to identify who's with us by watching them. You will know them by the fruit they bear. Just watch them a while. We act alike. Just watch them a while. We bless the Lord. Just watch them a while. We honor him even when our mouths aren't moving. You watch real saints a while and they will show you that they are different than the rest of the world. One of the things I love about Jesus and, and, and in the passage that I put in your notes, he, he, is, he is walking over and over, and as I said to you earlier, he says over and over, I am telling you over and over that when you see me, you've seen the Father, that there is absolutely, positively no difference. I have shown you him. I'm telling you that I'm, I have to leave you. They're saying, Jesus, we know you've shown us, but you're going to have to leave. He said, they said, don't leave. He said, I got to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to leave you the stuff that helped me to walk this thing out. I'm going I'm to send you the comforter. That spirit inside of you that came alive at conversion. He's helping you to do what you can't do for yourself. Jesus said when he show up inside of you, he's going to convict you of sin. He's going to make you aware of what you've been doing that disjoints the body. You're not going to need as many people to tell you because the Spirit of God's going to tell you. Once you know where you belong, he's going to talk to you. That ain't right, baby. What I love about it is that when you grow in God, as you mature in God, everybody listening to me, there'll be times when you'll be away from people who know you and you'll think, okay, I can let my hair down and God will whisper, I've got more than the people you know watching you. There are people who need to know me even if they don't know you.
And so we have similar behaviors. We'll talk about it. I want to give you this last quote as we make ready to sing. I thought this was so fitting, and I want you to think about this because ultimately, in order to behave the way that we should behave in this community, we have to grow up. We have to mature. So watch this quote. Maturity in the Christian life is measured only by only one test. That test is simple. How much closer to his character have we become? As you and I live in this week, there's only one measurement for whether or not we're growing. And that is that we get closer to his character or further away from it. As you go forth into your homes this week, I know there'll be things that are trying to disrupt your relationship. There'll be one test that determines whether or not you're moving and, and flowing the way God wants you to. Are you getting closer to his character or not? And I want to submit to you that there are many of us who show up in church week in and week out. And we walk one way on Sunday, but when we leave, our character is falling away from what we know God is calling us to. I don't know about you. I just want to be so unified in this hour. I want people walking with me who just love God, who want to who wanna get this thing right for God. We don't have to be perfect because he's going to perfect us. But we do have to say, God, you can have all of me. I'm yours. We do have to make up our mind that we want everything about him to flow through our mind and our hearts.